if you've been through, if you've been going with us through the new man, uh, we've been talking a lot of different stuff here. We've been trying to build up in certain areas, get you aware of certain things. Um, the next step actually from this would probably be uh, going through the manifested sons of God that we taught actually a little while back. We have a manual like this and the CDs that go with it. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because it goes a little bit, it, it's, it's like it takes one piece of this, and which is the main piece, because as you are a new creation, okay, let's go through the process. If you're born again, you're a new creation. If you're a new creation, you have been recreated, hence the term new creation, and you have been recreated, <clears throat> and that new creation, what you've been recreated into, is a son of God. Now, you say, but I'm, I'm a lady. I, how can I be a son? There is no male or female, and we're all sons in him. Now, you're sons and daughters, but the reference primarily is to be being sons, and you're going to act like a son even if you're a lady, okay? <clears throat> because you're going to mimic and imitate Jesus. Amen? So it's not about, <clears throat> you know, the gender in this case. It's about who you imitate. And so in this, we take specifically what the Bible says in the New Testament about being sons of God, and we go into detail on it. And we're gonna, we'll be touching on it quite a bit today also. Now, <clears throat> in that, here's the thing. Going through a three-day seminar, you've been receiving a lot of information, hopefully making notes, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but the main thing is that nobody can absorb it all in three days, right? Especially not in your head which is where it's got to go, not in your heart. Your heart already knows this. That's why, as I've been talking, your head will go, hmm, okay, and your heart's going, yeah, 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 that's right, that's it. Why? Because all I'm doing is quoting the Bible, okay? So the real key is to continue in this afterwards and to go back through it, read it again, go through different pieces. Take one thing and look at it. I mean, do an in-depth study on it. <clears throat> You've got uh, you know, 18 sessions here that you can go through. Today, we're going to be looking at specific scripture. And the reason we're doing that, uh, because you'll notice in your manual, it actually has on the first page there, on the table of contents, somewhere. Do I not have it in mine? <laughs> yeah, I might not have it in mine. Anyway, it has the table of contents there. <clears throat> and you'll notice that about half of it, there it is. It's on page five. <clears throat> about half of it, from section 7 on is all scripture. And you say, well, I've already got a Bible. I, I didn't need half of manual being scripture. Well, in case your Bible is too holy for you to write in, <clears throat> and if that's the case, just put it under a glass case somewhere on a shelf and go to Walmart and buy you one for $14 that you can mark up, all right? Uh, matter of fact, <clears throat> well, actually these didn't come from Walmart, but I have several uh, that I will take with me, especially if I go overseas and things, I'll take Bibles with me the first time and I'll leave them there. And that way, next time I go there, I get to travel lighter. Don't have to carry everything with me. So here we have section 7 uh, through 11, and we have Galatians 1 and 2, Galatians 3 and 4, Galatians 5 and 6, and then Ephesians 1 and 2, Ephesians 3 and 4, and you can see it goes all the way through. And then you'll also notice section 6, section 12, and section 18 is acknowledging what is in you. If you've not already looked through, through the manual, you'll notice that the first one had one in section six, had over a hundred or right at a hundred scriptures that are turned into what we would generally call confessions. Some people call them affirmations or just different, you know, what you call it doesn't matter as long as you say it, right? Then in section 12, if you want to turn there quick, I'll just show it to you. In section 12, now you get to turn these statements into confessions for yourself. So you get to practice. You've already done it. You see it. And so I give you the scripture. I start with a scripture of John 15, 1 through 17. And you go through what Jesus said and you turn that into confessions or into a statement dealing with you. And then I have John 16. And then you can just, from there, you ought to know how to take these different scriptures and turn them into confessions where you are acknowledging what is in you. Right? That's the key. It's not about confession. People get hung up on the confession message. The, the confession, the, the biblical idea of confessing God's word is simply learning to agree with what he said. Right? And, and getting that internalized in you so that's what you believe. Now, <clears throat> by the time you get to 
uh, session 18, yeah, <clears throat> it says turn these statements into confessions and it gives you more scriptures. So the, the, what I'm trying to show you and what I'm trying to do in this is <clears throat> first we did it for you. Now today I'm really going to be showing you more or less how to do it and where to find it and then you'll be doing it for yourself, right? I'm not trying to feed you a fish. I'm trying to teach you how to fish. Amen? That way you will not be dependent on me of waiting to get the, ne the next thing. Right? So, now in this, where are we at here? There we go. Got a bunch of stuff here with me. More pins than I need. So, all right. <clears throat> here was, very quickly, a couple of questions. If I get into some of them, we will be here all session. Uh, but I will try to comment on some quick ones here. Uh, can you use a prayer cloth for multiple, multiple people multiple times? Yes, yes. We have uh, seen uh, one prayer cloth, as people call it, uh, that we sent to one lady that had a brain tumor, and she was diagnosed terminal with that. Uh, she was part of a group that basically all of them had been diagnosed terminal, and they were, they were really all there just to comfort one another till they died. And they had already lost several of their members, and so they were just... They were all in the same boat, and so they were just trying to comfort each other. Uh, then one lady heard through a, another person uh, about us. Uh, she went to a meeting. Uh, at that time, didn't, didn't do anything or say anything, didn't contact us, really. But then after she went home, this, she lived in Springfield, Missouri. And when she went home, then she wrote to us and asked for a prayer cloth. So we sent her one, and it was a kind of a bandana type thing, and she tied it around her head. And so she wore it for about, I think, she, I think it was a week maybe a week, and uh, then she went back to the doctor and the tumor was gone, and they saw no uh, cancer cells in her blood system. And so she went back to her group, told them about it, and they wanted it. So she gave it to the next one, and they went through, and each one wore it, and everybody got healed, right? So uh, prayer clause, there's no difference. And the thing is, it's, and, and it, again, it's just so, if we could ever just get everybody to see God, God wants everybody healed. And he doesn't care. And when I say this, people say, oh, you, God doesn't care. Okay, I don't know a better way to say it. But God doesn't care who gets healed or when. He just wants everybody well. He doesn't care how. He doesn't care if you get healed through laying on of hands, through a prayer cloth, through a phone call, through an email. We've had people healed through emails uh, where we just write out a, a prayer that we're praying for them and send it to them. And they get healed when they read it. Right? Uh, there was one time, I remember early on when we were, to be honest, we were just experimenting. We were trying to figure out how many ways does this work? And so we uh, put up this, wrote like an email and said, uh, when you get this, there was a dot in the middle. It said, put your finger on the dot and be healed. And the person did it. We sent it to a person they, on their screen, on their computer screen. They weren't even touching the real dot. It was the picture of a dot. Okay. And they touched it and got healed. So God is more willing to heal than most people are willing to receive, right? Because most people, it's funny, most people keep trying to believe God as though he's this big liar and we have to try to believe him. Believing God is the easiest thing in the world. He's the only person you can actually depend on. You got that? Everybody else will fail you. Everybody else will stab you in the back, talk about you, whatever. Everybody, that's what happens. The Bible says put no trust in a brother. That's what it says. Imagine that, <clears throat> right? But it says, put your trust in the Lord, Amen. right? And so you trust God. And so when your trust is in God, people can't let you down because you don't expect anything. Yeah. Amen? It's a good way to live. If you don't expect anything, you can't be offended because people can't let you down. Right. So you just live without offense. 99% <clears throat> of all Christians in the world today, all the, you know what they worry about most? Unforgiveness. And they're not even in unforgiveness. But they worry about being unforgiveness. And the worry about it's worse than would actually be in it because if you were in it, you could just get out of it. But most people worry about it and that becomes the unpardonable sin just about because that'll keep you from getting healed, it'll keep you from getting blessed, all this stuff. And you have to realize, why would anybody live in unforgiveness? You're a Christian. Unforgiveness is sin. Christians aren't supposed to sin. Amen? You're awful quiet. <laughs> Y'all a bunch of sinners or what? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, uh, this one says, I have a book, John G. Lake, his life, his sermons, his boldness of faith. 
put out by Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Gloria said she got these documents from the grandchildren. Yeah, she got them actually from uh, Gertrude and Wilford, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it says, I thought you were in charge of all material. Well, I'm in charge. He gave me all material, uh, Wolf, Will and uh, Gertrude. Uh, they gave me all the, all the unedited sermons. All the sermons that were already out there were already edited. And even the ones they passed out out of the back of their... <laughs> they used to go to Bible schools like Rhema. In 1983, they were at Rhema in the parking lot. And the students would come around them. And they had, um, back then, mimeographed copies of different things, and they were basically selling them out of the back of the trunk of their car, right? And they stood there, and they just had stapled things, and they were these sermons. That's the same sermons that uh, uh, Gloria got. And so Gloria, they had that, and since they gave them permission to do that, then I really don't have any say-so over that. But now we have all of that, and we can publish anything we want with John G. Lake, any of his sermons or anything else. I have both the edited sermons that pretty much everybody has, but I also have the unedited sermons. What Will and Gertrude were giving away were the edited sermons because that's the only things that the Bible schools would let them give out, right? Because they didn't want the unedited version. Matter of fact, well-known publishing houses told them, we will publish these sermons if you let us edit. That, that's why the only ones you've ever seen in print are the edited ones, because the publishing house won't do it. Now, if you read in uh, Kenneth and Gloria's book, uh, Kenneth, it's funny because Gloria is, as you may know, is the one that really is into healing, right? And we've talked several times, and I've met with him before, and uh, <clears throat> it's funny, when I first, first time I ever met him was at a Southwest Believers Convention, and... Uh, we talked a little bit first. Some people knew I was there, and then they made the way for me to go back and talk to them. I didn't know where I was going. They were just leading me through this path, and we ended up. I walked into a room. They opened a curtain, and there was Kenneth and Gloria and Jesse Duplantis and Jerry Savelle and um, Carolyn and I'm trying to think who else was there. Um, yeah, and so they were all sitting there, and, you know, you kind of, I mean, these are people you grew up listening to, and they open a curtain and they say, well, step in here and you step in and then they're all sitting there looking at you kind of like, ah, 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 you know. <laughs> so, so I sat down and we talked for about 20, 30 minutes uh, before the next session uh, for the convention there had to start. And it was funny because uh, Gloria was all about healing. What about this? The doctrine, you know, what, what about this? What about that? What about that? And so we started going through it. Kenneth was more about Wilford and because they had known each other. They had talked a bit. And honestly, I think Kenneth was testing me to see if I had actually known them and had been in contact. And they were asking me, he was asking me details about Wilford and well, you know, what about this, what about that? And, and um, made some statements and different things. And I, I could kind of tell, yeah, you're just seeing if I really knew them. <laughs> you know, so, but um, they, and I, and I told him, I said, I have these. Well, Gloria has actually written to us several times, says she loves our website, loves the material we're putting out. But if you'll notice in the front of the book that they have, it says, we have not edited this. We have printed them exactly the way we received them. That is true. But they received them edited. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's the difference. They didn't do anything to it. Believe me, they would have published it just as the way it was. I really believe that. But Will, Will and Gertrude believed that whoever was supposed to pick up the ministry, they should get it and decide what to do with them from there. And honestly, you know, the ministry was passed to us in 1987, roughly. Um, 87 into 88 and uh, it's funny because this book that we just published is the first thing we've ever published of all the manuscripts and everything that uh, that they gave us and we've got a lot of it but I've just never put the stuff out because well number one there was no need to right but also it was a matter of most of the church wasn't ready for it and if we if the, the minute we put out the unedited sermons I'm going to have to make sure as soon as they come out I'm going to have to have at least about six months here where I'm not going anywhere because I'm going to be answering questions from everybody that's going to be writing in because it's going to make a big stir because of the things that are in the unedited. Matter of fact, most of it is what I teach during the DHT. Awesome. Right? The parts we teach that is so different, that's the parts that were cut out because they were so different and people didn't like that. They wanted the person to have to have faith. See? And yet, that's not biblical. And so, when you can make the people have faith instead of you having faith, then you don't have to take responsibility. <coughs> and if you don't have to have responsibility, that makes it real easy just to show up to a healing service 
And if people don't get healed, blame it on them and leave town with an offering. That's the way it works, all right? So, okay. Um, when you start to take responsibility, though, it's a whole different world, okay? So, anyway, so yes, we do have uh, authority to do that. There were some things that Harrison House had put out, um, even some stuff by Wilford Wright that Harrison House had put out at one time. Uh, matter of fact, but we, again, we have uh, the right to put those things back out and put them out in a way that it was originally ordered, okay? Because the thing about publishing houses is once you sign with them, they can do your book. Uh, you, they'll do it. They'll pay you royalties for about three years, and after that, the book is theirs. And they don't have to pay you anything after that. And they can take all the material. They can chop it apart and put it out different ways. And you'd be surprised at, at, at many of the things that you will read by different people. You read the same thing in different ways because they put it out in different books. They'll put a new title on it, a new cover on it, and you'll end up buying a book and it'll be the same thing you've read before, wow. right? Because they have the right to do it and the real author of that is not getting a dime from that. So because the contract requires you to give rights to that. That's why we've never signed with a book publisher. We have, we've done all of our own publishing and actually what I'm in the process now, what we really look forward to is becoming a publishing company so that we can publish material without editing it, Amen. right? And, but you have to have that to be able to get into the bookstores. You have to go through a publishing company. So we'll start one, right? That's what you do. So, um, so we're headed that direction. So, uh, so if you're an author and you have manuscript, we'll be printing other people's manuscript. Uh, just, and, and one of the main things about it was that uh, we're gonna make sure that the authors get the royalties, not, we're not gonna keep it, right? So that's, that's the whole point. All right, so if Christ is referring, if quote unquote Christ is referring to the anointed one and the anointing, is there a difference between being communicated in when it says in Christ Jesus versus, or I'm sorry, Jesus Christ versus Christ Jesus? No. What you really have to look at usually is go back to the original Greek. The original Greek often is backwards, and you have to just see how it's written. So generally, it's not, unless they are trying to emphasize his humanity at one point versus his positioning uh, at a, in another point. So really, that's all you have to look at. It's really not trying to say anything different. It might be emphasizing his uh, deity or his uh, positioning over his humanity, right? So that's, you just have to check it out. But generally, it is saying the same thing. If someone is in another state with MS, is it best to pray over the phone, use a prayer cloth, use a proxy? Uh, they say that they ask about that one. It, it doesn't matter. It's however you can release your faith. That's what counts. Uh, the re every person that I've ever seen come back from the dead yet, I've said the same thing. It's no, but it's not a magic, you know, incantation. But the reason I've used it, it just what, it's what comes out. It's what I said whenever my first daughter was raised. Uh, well, the first daughter that was raised, <laughs> um, which was actually my third daughter, Rebecca. And since that time, since it worked, it just comes out. It's, it's, a, it's how I can release my faith. And so... However you can release your faith, release your faith. Whatever it takes to release your faith, release your faith, right? Because that's what gets it done. That's the connection with God. Now, um, <clears throat> usually if, if a, per this is amazing. When, you, when a person stands in proxy for another, it's, you're still having faith for the other person. So you're standing there in their place, so to speak. Now, technically, you're not right? Technically, you're making a request, and so you really can't stand in proxy, technically. Regardless, you're going to pray in faith for that person. So you're just the one bringing the request. You are, you know, the Roman centurion, or you are Jairus, or you are, you know, the woman of Canaan. You're just the person making the request, unless, of course, uh, it is your faith that's being used, right? Many people will come for prayer and their faith is in the person that they're going to try to get to pray. Right. And when that person prays, then it's funny because they will think that the person that prayed is the person that got it done. And really, it was the person that came and requested it. And as soon as the person prayed, they released their faith and it was their faith that got it done. Mm -hmm. okay? So because and, and I'm not saying that the, hopefully the person praying has faith also. Mm -hmm. But the real key is it's not who has faith, but somebody has to have faith. Right. Somebody has to have faith. So, now, uh, is, uh, yeah, okay. 
if someone has multiple problems, 15 doctors, that's <laughs> multiple problems, is it best to pray for healing and for demons to leave? Okay, uh, since, since it's possible as well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, you get what you believe for. When you speak, and really regardless of what you say, it's what you're believing that you get. Okay? I could be believing for this person to be healed, and I could say, shoehorn, and they'd still get healed. Why? Because it's the believing. It's not, it's not the words. You got that? It's just the believing. And many people say, uh, you know, they'll give me a, a prayer request, and they'll say, would you, would you pray for this? And I'm like, okay, yeah. And I, I look at it, and then they're waiting for me to say words. <laughs> Saying the words is not technically what counts. I can look at it and go, in the minute I believe, I look at it and go, okay, yep, yep, that's Bible, yep, okay, yeah. I don't have to say, in Jesus' name, be healed. Even Jesus, think, okay, if we went and looked at um, uh, the Roman centurion, whenever he came to Jesus, and he says, you know, no, you don't have to come to my house, uh, just speak the word, I'm a man under authority, I understand, you give a command, it'll work. Jesus turns around and says, I hadn't found this kind of faith in all of Israel. Then he turns back around and says, uh, go your way, according to your faith, be it done unto you. He never says, servant, be healed. He never prays. He never says anything about the servant. He just tells the centurion, what you believed, that's the way it'll be. That's it. And you see that over and over again in Scripture. We have things set up in our minds of how it has to be. God doesn't have it set up in his mind of how it has to be. right? And the real key is learning flow. That's, people get mad. I've had people walk out of meetings if I didn't open the meeting with a prayer, right? And, and I had one person, we did a DHT, and we broke at lunch, and we came back. We had a few less people, and it was a small group, so it's pretty easy to see that we'd lost some. And the <laughs> lady came to me, and she said, well, we lost three ladies at the, at, during lunch. I said, well, how come? Uh, they said, you, you didn't pray when you opened up this morning, so you couldn't be of God. I said, well, it's probably a good thing they left because if that made them mad, I'm guaranteeing I'm making them more mad by the end of the day. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, because we have to realize this is not about do it, going through some religious ritual, right? This is life. And people really live or really die based on what you do with this message. So honestly, I don't have time to play religious games with people that just want to you know, go off and talk about, oh, well, Brother Curry gave me a prophetic word, and here's my little notebook, and, you know, here's 40 other prophecies I've received that none of them's come to pass, right. you know, but they're, they're, you know, prophecy collectors, oh my God. And, it's, and I have people come, well, I have a word for you, yeah, I got a word for you too, go read your Bible, <laughs> you know, I don't need any more words, I got a whole lot right here I hadn't even done yet, right. amen, I'm busy about my father's business, I know what I'm supposed to be doing, if God tells you something, you go do it, yeah. right? If you hear from him so well, you go do what he says. So that's what Dr. Summerall used to tell us. So uh, when we minister to people, you can, okay, in the beginning stages, normally you will be very specific and you'll try to laser in on this thing. You'll try to be a specialist and hit this thing, and, and, which is sad because if somebody has 15 doctors, they've probably got at least 15 different problems. And then you're going to be there all day going, okay, now this, now that, now do this, now do And that, there's no need for that. You have to realize it's just like pouring water on a dry plant. It will go where it needs, right? You lay your hands on a person, you speak a word, you're speaking words of spirit and life, you're speaking words of healing. And whenever you speak, that, that water of life goes into them and it goes everywhere it's needed. You don't have to be specific. It'll go everywhere it's needed. If the power of God doesn't pass by a problem just because you didn't mention it, right? Unless you believe that you have to mention everything. According to your faith, be it unto you. If a person has 15 problems and you mention one, one's going to get healed because that's where your faith is, one at a time. <clears throat> so I learned early on, step back, go head to toe. In the name of Jesus, life, head to toe. Because it's life that heals. It's not healing power. It's not you know, delivering power. It's not, it's not like that. God doesn't have different powers. He has life. Life drives out sickness. Life drives out death. Life drives out darkness. Why? Because life is light. And so the real key is learning to see the big picture and not being a specialist, but being a general practitioner. 
See, the, the, the greatest faith you can have is to take the most, most general promise and apply it to the most specific problem. And so you don't even have to have a healing promise. You can say, uh, you know, along the lines of whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. Okay? In Jesus' name, be healed. What am I doing? I'm asking in his name. Okay? And so whenever you do that, then that's what you get. The thing that we want to get away from is this idea. Most Christianity has, has degenerated toward Gnosticism to where you have to know the secret. You have to be initiated into this thing, and there's some details. And we have to realize you do not see that in the Bible. You see Jesus being so general about things. What do you want? I want to receive my eyesight. Receive your eyesight. Okay? You could have said anything. Hey, that's what he said. What do you want me to do for you? That's what he, he didn't say. Now, here's what the Lord wants to do for you. He didn't say that. Well, what do you want me to do for you? Well, you know, what do you need? Well, I need this. Okay, well, hang on just a minute. Let me pray and ask God if he wants you to have that. You, don't, you never see that. Why? Because if it has to do with light, life, and love, God wants it for you. Right? He gave you everything that pertains to life and godliness. We don't have to be so nitpicky over these things. But if you are nitpicky over them, then that's the rule you've set, and that's how you have to live. And that's now, because if you, if you believe you have to be specific, and then you don't get specific, then the devil will use that, nope, that's not what he believed. That's not what he did. He didn't do it right according to his own standard, so it can't happen. And then we wonder why it didn't happen. And so we have to learn. <clears throat> if you talk about healing and demons, do like Wigglesworth. It, it's all from the devil. Sickness and disease, it's all from the devil. Demons, all from the devil. Go to the source. Don't hit the symptoms. Right? Tell it, be healed, be free in Jesus' name. Well, what does that mean? See, if you have a demon and it's causing you a physical problem, <clears throat> I can hit the physical problem and not deal with the demon, and now you've still got a situation going on, right? And now people have come to the point where they think they have to be specific about it, but in reality, it's a matter of, okay, see, what the truth about it is this. If I tell your body to be healed, if a demon made that body sick, then for your body to be healed, that demon has to go. You got that? I don't have to tell the demon to go. I just tell you to be healed. Because if the demon is what's making your body that way, then for your body to be healed, and what I'm doing is I'm speaking the end result. The end result will, will be simply this. You be healed. That's it. Now, whatever it takes. See, I don't care what it takes. I don't care <clears throat> if the Holy Spirit has to have a gift, you know, to operate there. I don't care if, if it takes an angel to come down and rip that demon out of a person. I don't care. Bottom line is my job is to set the person free. And as an ambassador, I don't do it myself. I speak, and God has angels to take care of it. Amen? And so whatever they need to do, they do. I don't care. I don't delve into that. Now, we are, there are some things that we have learned that we could get real specific, and we can go into these things. But I'm telling you, most of it, you just learn by doing, and there's things you don't need to know. People say, well, how do you know to do this? How do you know to do that? Most of the time, you don't until you do it. When you do it, what comes out is the way it should have been done if you're allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you. Now, some things I'll say exactly the same way every time. Why? Because my intent is the same. Healed, head to toe. That's what I want. And so that's what we say. So <clears throat> be as general as possible, but as specific as necessary. Okay? So, that's, so you can do either one. You can say, that's like Jesus said, whether it's easier to say, rise and be healed or your sins be forgiven. Well, which is easier to say, be healed or demon come out? Doesn't matter. Bottom line is, the end result is total healing and freedom. Amen? Amen? We've got to move beyond the babyhood stage of being so specific that we think we have to be that specific. We don't have to be that specific. Jesus was seldom that specific. Okay? So, now, here's one. <clears throat> when Angelo died, you spoke to God about Angelo. Why did you choose not to switch gears, as I say, to raise Angelo from the dead? Well, first off, I'll say I'm sure you would have done it better, but you weren't there. So, <laughs> okay. here's what I have to say about that. Angelo is alive today. So it doesn't matter. Amen? Now, you say, well, why didn't you do that? Don't know. Different things, different situations, different mood. 
right? Say that. <laughs> I'm going to fix an open can of worms, let me tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, do you remember years ago, whenever Benny Hinn, uh, he'd been having tremendous uh, miracles and you know, healings and things going on, and then he took off his jacket and he started waving it at people? Remember that? And people started falling and different things, and then, they, oh, man, he caught all the flack, and I think even the Assemblies of God were going to pull his papers or something. There's all that stuff going on. And it's funny because during that time, we had already started ministering, and so Unless you're doing it, there's things you don't know. You see, right now I'm putting together a, a biography of John Lake. And there's things that people have questions about that when I read it, I'm like, why would people question that? But the reason I don't question it is because I've been in that same situation. And so I, I know I can tell you what he was thinking. Why? Because I've been there. And so unless you do it, there's a lot of things you'll never know. And you'll have wondering and it'll be th because it's theory and these kind of things but if and when you you really and, and i'm really i'm not trying to sound like i'm putting you down i'm really not but i'm saying once you delve into this and once you step over that line that religion has drawn and you step into walking in real i mean just real raw christianity you're going to find out that all the stuff you've always been waiting for has always been waiting for you. That, that all this stuff that you feel like that you've got to do this and you've got to talk to God about that and you have, you have to get his permission to do that, and that that's not true. That even if you look at the old prophets in the Old Testament, they walk more like sons of God than Christians do. They want to, people will come and say, do this. I mean, think about this. How, how much does God care about an ax head? Right, he's running the universe. Right. And, and here's a, a Bible school student, right, that loses an axe head in the water. And you think that's a big deal? Only to the student and whoever owned the axe head, right? Whoever owned the axe that the student borrowed it from. But now this student goes to the prophet and, and says, I lost an axe head. You know, the prophet today, most people would say, okay, go buy another one. Well, it probably wasn't that easy back then. They didn't have a Lowe's or Home Depot. You had to go make your own axe, right? And there was a whole lot more to it, and it cost more money back then, too. And so this prophet goes over and just touches the water, and the axe head floats. You do not find any place where he prayed. Almost every miracle that the prophets performed, you don't see, see any uh, communication between them and God before they do it. Why? Because, and you get this, the amazing thing is, the Holy Spirit just rested upon them. He wasn't even in them. He rested upon them. And they did great miracles and did these things and didn't even talk to God. And some things, you know, stuff we don't like to talk about. Here comes, you know, the prophet. And these kids run out and go, oh, bald head, bald head. And he goes, ha. Ah. And a bear comes out and eats them. Well, that's pretty rough. I mean, come on, you know, if, if that happened every time somebody said something about you, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know what the rumor went around, you know, when you see the prophet, don't mention the bald head, <laughs> right? Just, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But see, all this stuff that we look at, we have this idea how, how things are. I can show you many, many examples in the Bible where things happened that it didn't say God did, but it was just where a, a, a man of God, prophet, apostle, somebody said it and it happened. Why? Because power resides in you. And, and you will be held accountable how you handle that power. You'll be held accountable, accountable what you did with that power. And some people never use it at all. You'll be held accountable for that. See? And, and then if you use it wrongly, you'll be held accountable for that. If you do something wrong with it, there's times when I, man, you know, you get in traffic, <laughs> you know, and I, I have to watch my mouth. I, you know, because if it was up to me, it's like, ooh, flat tires, four flat tires. <laughs> when that, get them out of the way. Just put, you know, you want to say that stuff, you know. But, but you, you can't, there's stuff you can't say. Why? Because I, there's things, I mean, think about this. <laughs> 
I remember when I first learned the reality, I started praying for people and people got started getting healed. I was still working a regular secular job and I realized I can't call in sick. <laughs> Especially if I wasn't. <laughs> because I knew if I said that, I would get sick. You say, well, that's ridiculous. Well, guess what? It's true. You have what you say. You say, well, that's only if you believe it in your heart. So you're telling me you say a lot of things you don't believe in your heart? You liar. You know, at some point, and so I, I speak life and health. I can't speak sickness, disease, and death, and doom, and gloom, and problems, and stuff. Why? You know, because it happens. And so this is why when people talk about you, that's why Jesus said, listen, forgive. It wasn't about, you know, you not living in unforgiveness per se in that sense, but it's saying, look, if they say things against you, you have to forgive so that thing doesn't happen to them because it doesn't hit you. It goes back to them. Now you got preachers standing up saying, all right, let's, who's been cursed by somebody? All right, now we're going to send that curse back to them. That is not Christian. It says to forgive. It says to bless those that curse you, not send the curse back. But since it's so satisfying to the flesh, you have preachers that do that. And I remember watching television one time and a preacher right here in town did that. And, you know, actually, I think I was in a, yeah, I was in a motel because I was watching on television in a motel. And I remember thinking, it's a good thing I'm in a motel because if I was at home, I'd be buying a new television. <laughs> because I want to put a brick through that thing because this guy's an idiot. And now I'm looking at all these people and there's over 400 people in that room and they're all rushing down to the front so they can send curses back on people. And apparently there wasn't a person there smart enough spiritually to even say, hey, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say we're supposed to bless and not curse? But because it fed the flesh, everybody thought, well, the preacher said do it. Let's do it. That's why you have to analyze everything people say. You don't just take it at face value. So the, the, but the real key is that you have the power of God abiding in you. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit with Jesus, it's what Till Osborne said, the Spirit of God in a human makes a Christian. You get that? The Spirit of God in a, in a person makes a Christian. Well, the Spirit of God in or upon anyone makes them anointed. That is the anointing, is the Spirit of God being upon them. And the difference with us, as opposed to the Old Testament, is the Spirit of God came upon them at times, and in many cases abode upon them. But with us, He doesn't come upon us. He is within us. He resides within us. And He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's with us. So because of that, the power of God is with us. Now, the Holy Spirit isn't just a power. He's a person, but He is the executor of power. And wherever the Holy Spirit is, there is power. Go back and read. You ever read where it said, and the power of the Lord was present to heal? Read that passage. Nobody got healed. Nobody got healed there. Even though the power of the Lord was present to heal, nobody got healed. Just because the, present of, the presence of God is there to heal doesn't mean people get healed. And so we have to realize it is up to us. That's why he tells us to lay hands on the sick. That's why he says, who sins you remit, they're remitted. Who sins you retain, they retain. We have a responsibility. Way greater than most Christians ever realize. Well, I'm just going to throw this out. Years ago, uh, me and, and my best friend at that time, we walked and talked about this stuff and really were digging it out and had questions. And honestly, everywhere we went, we asked the questions and nobody had any real answers. And so we were trying to figure it out ourselves and I just asked the Holy Spirit. and asked, I mean, we were just constantly walking and talking and going through the scriptures. And, you know, we just got to a place where we didn't know we were seeing things that we'd never seen anybody do. We had seen a way of life. And I, I told him at one time, I said, if, if I ever really fulfill the will of God, I probably won't have a home. I will probably just be on the road, just, just go and just preach and just travel and just do it. I said, that, that's, that's the way I, I, don't, I don't see in the Bible where it says, you know, stop here and... and you know, build your retirement home. And, and I don't see that. I said, I see this going. And he said, but Curry, because I told him, I said, and we talked about it. And he said, but is that for just for you or is it for everybody? And I said, well, Dr. Summerall said, if it's not for everybody, it's not for anybody. And I said, I'm just reading the Bible and it says do it. And if I read the Bible and it's for me, then anybody that reads the Bible, it should be for them. And he said, Curry, you're saying that everybody, nobody should have a job. Everybody should just travel around preaching. And I said, yeah. I said, I, I don't, I don't see. He said, how would that work? He said, Who, who's, how are you, you going to live? 
I said, I don't know. That's up to God. Right? See, but see, you have to remember, I was like 22 at that time, right? And so there was a lot of stuff I hadn't seen, but I'm seeing the Bible, and I'm looking at all these things. And then he says, we're, we're talking about, he goes, but Craig, that doesn't make sense. If everybody just quit their job and just started traveling around, he said, how would everybody live? And I said, maybe we wouldn't have to live that long. <laughs> maybe we get this job wrapped up and get out of here. <laughs> you know? Maybe the reason it's taken so long is because we're so tied and entangled in the affairs of life, you know? And so we started looking at that, and so I had to figure out, okay, how, how do I do this? How does this work out? And I'm not, you know, saying everybody ought to run back home and quit their job and sell their houses and, you know, buy an RV. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying you shouldn't. And, but here's what I told my friend. He said, Craig, how would that work? I said, look, everybody's not going to do this. That's the thing. E even if God said in there, Quit your job, go on the road, and don't have a home, and just travel and preach. I said, there would be Christians that would tell Jesus he's Lord, and they still wouldn't do it. I said, so I know everybody's not going to do that. And I said, but the ones that he's put it in their heart definitely to do it, there's their commission. So it's really that simple. And so... <clears throat> We have to realize God has given us this power. No, see, I'm, I'm talking about this, but we've never seen a Christian do this yet. We've seen bits and pieces. We've seen a little burst of power, but we've never seen, especially a body of Christians, live this out. We've, we've never seen a church, a local church, live out this new creation. You've never seen it. Because I guarantee if you had, it would change everything. Just one person truly living it would change everything. But the problem is, the enemy comes along, and there's a lot of... Listen, I'm not the first person to see this. A lot of people have seen this along the lines, you know, along, through, through time, I should say. And they've seen it, and they head that direction, and then the enemy sidetracks them. And ends up aborting what God is trying to, to do. Now, I'm not talking about getting everybody to go and always travel all the time. And that I'm talking about living this life out. Because what happens is, you start living this life. And all of a sudden, people hear about you. And then all of a sudden, now you're not as free to do what you used to do because you've got 10,000 prayer requests. Mm -hmm. So now you start to have to slow down a little bit just to try to get to everybody because if your heart is toward God, then your heart's toward people. And if your heart's toward people, you don't want to see people hurt. You want to you answer every prayer request. You want to answer. You want to talk to every person on the phone. You want to fellowship with everybody. You want to tell everybody everything. Mm -hmm. And yet then, because that happens and because God starts doing some amazing things and people hear about it, all of a sudden you get popular and now you're, you start having crowds and the more crowds there are, the more organization there has to be and the more organization there has to be, the more you get pushed into a business mindset because you have to run a business, especially here in America, mm -hmm. because the church here is a business. It's a, it's a corporation according to the United States uh, Judicial Code, basically. And so now, and because, you, guess, you know why it has to be a business? Because people want tax deductible. They want, I'll give, but I want, I, want it, I want to take it off my taxes. And if you want to take it off your taxes, now we've got to be a 501c3 or some other type of uh, tax-exempt corporation, and now we're under the laws of government. And then for a long time, they said, you can't say this and you can't say that, all because people wanted tax-deductible you know, benefits. And now you're trapped into this thing, and it's become this whole thing. And then along comes somebody like Donald Trump and says, preachers can say whatever they want to say. Amen. Amen. And so I'm like, yeah, all right. Well, he's smart. He knows that that was his base. You know, so, so set them free. They'll talk about him. Everybody knows that. So, you know, he didn't get where he's at by being stupid. Okay. So, but that's what happens is this, this, now this, all you want to do is help people. And all of a sudden now it's become this machine. And then you get boxed into this thing. And then not to mention the religious idea of how people think you should be. You know, and how you should act. And, how you, and do you realize when you act the way people want you to act, it takes forever to get anything done. Yeah, right. exactly right. It takes forever. Why? Because what I can tell you in five minutes, I have to spread out to 45 minutes. Why? Because if I said it in five, it would be very blunt, very harsh, and you'd get mad. <laughs> but if I can spread out in 45 minutes, I can make it easier on you and you'll receive it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it works. Yeah. Exactly. And so what we have to do is we have to end up, uh, you know, we end up being a business and that was never intended. See, people say, well, you know, 
I believe God's called me to pastor a church, but man, I don't want to do all that stuff. Okay, you're, you're mixing what God said with what the government said. God doesn't say anything about 501c3. He doesn't say anything about all these, uh, how many, you have, he doesn't even say you have to have a board of directors, right? That's the government that says that. See, all this stuff goes into, God, does, God has never called a board of directors. God calls a man. He gives a man a message. Then he gives man either some form, and when I say charisma, I don't mean charm or personality. I'm talking about the ability, the presence of God with him to draw people to that message so the message can be spread. That's the way God does things. That's what he did with Moses, and that's what he did with Jesus, and that's what he did with Paul. He, he gives a person a message and then says, here, I'll give you the ability to draw people together so you can spread this message. He never said, get a board of directors and let's figure out how to do this and let's check on you know, the, the, the rates for mortgages before we buy a building and before we do that. That's why we lease this building. We don't, we don't own this building. I really, I don't care about buildings. Never have cared. We don't even, I don't even, we don't even own our house. Yeah. And my, my kids have bought houses before we did. Why? Because I wasn't sure where I was going to be. Still not sure. You know, I just, I, I could be anywhere. I don't care. It makes me no difference. Right? Give me a Bible. Give me a couple of, you know, good books. I'm, I'm good. Let's travel. Let's preach. Let's watch what God does. All this other stuff, it's, 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 it's most of the time it's more of a hindrance. You know? And so now we're trying to spread it as quickly as we can. Then, you start getting into television, all of a sudden you got to have these many programs and this much time and 28 minutes and 30 seconds and it's got to be down to the second. And believe me, because I have to, I end up preaching 25 minutes. Now imagine me preaching 25 minutes. Okay? Yeah, I'm doing good to keep it at 45 minutes. You know, for any, for any one session, 25 minutes, I'm talking fast. I mean, because I'm getting it all out there as quick as I can. Yeah. That's what people say. There's so much packed into these, in each you know, broadcast. Why? Because I don't want to leave it halfway. I'm not trying to get you to watch tomorrow. I want you to get it all today because I don't want somebody to die between today and tomorrow. Amen. So that's why people say, you talk so fast. That's right. And, and they, they figured out one time that I get twice as many words on a CD than the average preacher. <laughs> and when they told me that, I said, good, let's charge them twice the money. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did but we do. We, we, we have about twice the amount of, of information. And so I'm not trying to hold anything back. I'm trying to make sure you're prepared for what's coming next. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And so, well, we've used this whole session on questions. So, <laughs> we... If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world.